Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for joining us tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Florida International University's Cuban Research Institute, Miami Book Fair, and everyone at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Dr. Victor Del B to discuss his newest book, Emilio Sanchez in New York and Latin America, published by Rutledge. The book considers Emilio Sanchez in the wider context of mid-century Cuban artists and reflects on his mobile observation of the American and Caribbean vernacular in seeming opposition with the mainstream avant-garde of the 1940s and 50s. The work includes a foreword by Dr. Ann Cole and an introduction by Dr. Nathan J. Timpano, both of whom join Victor tonight to discuss the life and artistic endeavors of Emilio Sanchez. Victor Del P is a lecturer at the University of Miami School of Architecture. His research focuses on the art and architecture of the early modern Ibero-American world and mid 20th century Cuba. His books include Architectural Temperance, Spain and Rome, 1700-1759, Transformations in Classical Architecture, New Directions in Research and Practice, and Cuban Modernism, Mid-Century Architecture, 1940-1970, with Jean-Francois Lejeune. Dr. Delpi is also the president of, was the president of the Cintas Foundation, dedicated to promoting Cuban art and culture. Nathan J. Timpano is an associate professor, head of art history, and Director of Graduate Studies within the, the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Miami. And Ann Cole is an artist legacy advisor working with artists, estates, and foundations in New York City. Dr. Cole is also the former Executive Director and Curator of the Emilio Sanchez Foundation. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to your questions after their talk. I'll take a moment to remind you that you can purchase Emilio Sanchez in New York and Latin America from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. Every purchase you make supports Books and Books during these very trying times. So please hit that green button and own this gorgeous book. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the stage. Hi, Victor. Hi. Hi, Nathan. Hello. Hi, Anne. Come on, Anne. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're all very excited to be here. And I think uh, we're going to start this evening with Victor giving us a short introduction uh, to some of the experiences he had uh, that helped him produce this beautiful publication. So Victor, do you want to take it off? Sure. We can't see you, Anna. Or I can't see you. So I don't know if that's a... Can you see me now? I can see her on my end. Um, and I can see her on mine. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Technical glitch here. Let me get the PowerPoint up and running. Okay, there it is. So I need to share it. There we go. Okay. Is that good? Can everyone see that? I assume? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Christina and Mitchell and everyone at Books and Books for uh, arranging uh, this um, evening's conversation, as well as uh, Jorge Duani and everyone at the Cuba Research Institute for um, having uh, so quickly uh, jumped on the idea. I'm, I'm immensely grateful to everyone. I'd also like to uh, thank the co-sponsors of tonight's um, uh, discussion, and that includes the Cuban Heritage Collection at the University of Miami Libraries, the Lowe Art Museum at the University of Miami, and the School of Architecture 
at the University of Miami. All of these um, institutions and the people behind them uh, facilitated the uh, research and publication of this book, and I'm uh, incredibly grateful to them all. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who is attending uh, this evening's talk. I'm going to begin by uh, giving a short presentation about the process of writing the book. Rather than giving a summary of the book, uh, and that's because I think it's going to shed light on some aspects of Emilio that you might not know, as well as some aspects about academic writing that you might not know. And I say that because I did not approach this book from the perspective of Cuban studies, nor did I approach it from Latin American or Caribbean architecture, nor even 20th century modernism. In fact, the book began uh, with a, an investigation in architectural representation. I teach in a school of architecture, so I teach design, history and theory, and representation. So I'm as interested in the conventions of architectural drawing as I am in the rhetoric of architectural drawing, to use a term that James Ackerman uh, made famous in one of his essays. So in that first book that uh, Christina mentioned, Architectural Temperance, I was looking at the way the Spanish community in Rome in the early 18th century used images of spaces, of buildings, of ephemeral structures to engage in a kind of architectural diplomacy with the Holy See at a time when the Bourbon monarchy had assumed the uh, throne of Spain. So it was a kind of uh, use of architectural images to engage in uh, the, the kind of politics of Rome and European culture at the time. And these drawings, uh, for instance, the cover of the book with the Spanish church, Trinitarian church on the Via Condotti, and of course, Piranesi's view of the Piazza di Spagna, highlight the important role that the Spanish community played in the Eternal City. But I'm also equally as interested in the uh, conventions of architectural representation because I teach drawing. I'm teaching a drawing class right now. And so I'm fascinated by paper. I'm fascinated by uh, graphite, watercolors, brushes, the whole repertoire of materials associated with the production of architectural drawings. And I would add, I'm a particular fan of uh, art supply stores around the world. The great stores like Sennelier in Paris, opposite the Louvre, Zecchi in Rome, uh, in Florence, uh, just beneath the, the Duomo, Poggi in Rome, the late New York Central, which no longer exists. These are places that play a profound role in the cultural life of places, and they are a beacon to artists around them. So everything associated with architectural representation is of interest to me. Now, about seven years ago, I was living uh, in Connecticut, and I was teaching at the New York Institute of Technology, which had campuses in Old Westbury and in Columbus Circle in Manhattan. And the days that I would teach in Manhattan, I had afternoon classes. So I would take the train in, and I would get to the Metropolitan Museum at 10 a.m. when they opened. And I would get to spend three hours in the prints and drawings room, going over hundreds of architectural sketches, watercolors, sketchbooks, drawings, paintings. Uh, and the project I was engaged in was trying to understand the idea of the architectural sketch as an end in and of itself, rather than as a pre preparatory drawing, uh, the, the sketch as a, as a legitimate artistic endeavor. And this included oil sketching on paper, transferred to canvas like this wonderful Corot, watercolors, draw, graphite, sketchbooks, a whole repertoire of things. And I found, I found that between 1750 and 1850, artists from around the world were, were capturing cities, moments, landscapes, in Latin America, Europe, Africa, the Near East, Asia, bringing to light 
the world of um, contemporary monuments, cities, landscapes, buildings, and so little of this gets included in the history of architecture. So this project was uh, something I was starting when one day I decided to ask what the Met had on Cuba. And the reason was that uh, my wife, Jill, who many of you know, at that time was the uh, director of the Bellarmine uh, Museum at Fairfield University, uh, named after the uh, Jesuit Saint Roberto Bellarmino. And we were leading a tour of donors and um, alumni to Cuba as a fundraising trip. So I thought I should find out what the Met has on Cuba. So I quickly went to the site and I typed in Cuba. And the first thing that came up was this. I was stunned. It's not what I expected. I expected something by, by Wilfredo Lam or Amelia Pelaez. Instead, I saw this uh, shack, Caribbean shack, a farmer's house in rural Cuba, graphite on paper with uh, nuanced, uh, subtle lines, intense gradation of shadows, the contrast between bright light, dark, a slightly wonky perspective, not perfect, not scientific, and a kind of in-your-face composition that I just was fell in love with immediately. I asked myself, who did this? I saw Emilio Sanchez. Who's that? I'd never heard of him. I had no idea who he was. I then said, this has to be a 19th century grand tour artist in the Caribbean, right? When was this done? 1959, what? How can this be? 1959, abstract expressionism is well underway, turning into you know being challenged by pop modernism, Fidel Castro's in power, and this guy, Emilio Sanchez, is traveling through Cuba producing academic-like drawings of vernacular structures. I had to know more. So I asked the woman at the desk if they had anything more on, on, on uh, Sanchez. She did a quick search and said, well, nothing online. So if we do, you're going to have to check the card catalog. So I ran upstairs to the card catalog in the prints and drawings room. And I start looking and I find one index card for Emilio. Uh, another woman said, you may want to try Cuban architecture. So I find another one. And so I gave her these index cards and say, maybe uh, you have something on Emilio there, more stuff. She disappeared. And a few minutes later, she came back and said, well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we have quite a bit of stuff. The bad news is we're about to close for lunch. Can you come back at two? I said, well, I have to go teach, but I'll be back on Thursday. That night on the way home on the train, I did a quick search on my phone for Emilio Sanchez, and I found the link to the uh, foundation website and uh, the name of Ann Cole with an email address. So the next morning, I quickly typed off, fired off an email to Ann saying, Hey, I'm interested in Milo Sanchez, da, 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 what do you know? Within uh, 30 minutes, my phone rang, and it was Ann Cole. And I was, you know, very happy that um, she took the time to call, and even more happy when she said, look, you know, we, we know that there's stuff there, but it's never been sifted through properly or properly analyzed. So um, let me know what you find. From that moment on, you could say from day one, Anne has been involved in this project. And I have to thank her tremendously for the support. Uh, Nathan, as well, from the moment I got to Miami. But from day one, Anne was involved. So Thursday, I go to the Met. And they bring out a box, set two boxes, cylinder boxes, with over 250 drawings, watercolors, prints, um, sketchbooks, um, ink on uh, paper drawings, all of Cuba 
in the late 1940s and 1950s. I couldn't believe, and none of it had been cataloged. It has been sitting in these boxes for since 1965, untouched. And I realized immediately that there's a project here. I was uh, taken by the views of the colonial city, impressive buildings, rustic buildings, uh, Santi uh, cityscapes of Santiago, haunting interiors of ramshackle uh, shacks in the countryside, uh, cluttered bodegas, and this magnificent anthropomorphic study of the Belvedere torso pretending to be a tamarind tree in Cuba. I was, you know, it, but it wasn't just line drawings. There were watercolors, prints, woodcuts, um, colored pencil, landscapes, monuments, uh, dancing trees in the landscape, cabaret scenes, natural, the cabarets of Cuba. So the whole, I was immediately taken by the project and said, well, this deserves uh, my full attention. And so I uh, began to dive into Emilio Sanchez and everything that existed on uh, the literature. And um, after a few months, I came into another stumbling block or a stumbling block. We had known that Emilio had studied at the Art Students League. It had been noted in catalogs, it had been noted in uh, reviews, but we didn't have any evidence of it. Anne told me that she tried and she got nowhere. So I reached out to the, cura uh, the uh, archivist at the Art Students League, thinking that if I called her, I might get some somewhere further. And she told me, look, you know, we've been down this road before, there really is nothing. We don't even have a membership card. And I said, well, wait a minute. I have the membership card. And she said, how on earth do you have Emilio's membership card? I said, well, I found it at the Miami-Dade Public Library. He made a donation in 1985 and it says this little index card and there it is, it's, you know, joined in 1947 with the address and a doodle on the back. I sent it to her and within 30 minutes, I received this. Emilio's entire enrollment records at the Art Students League. Every course he took, every teacher he studied under and the various addresses that he lived at. I. I point out the Hotel Biltmore, which is a Warren for the architects. It's a Warren and Wetmore Tower that no longer exists. It was built as part of the Grand Central Terminal Complex with a train line that went directly under the hotel. And you could access the hotel from the hotel lobby from the train line. And in fact, that's where the old clock tower that is now in the central kiosk, information kiosk at Grand Central used to be, so the old saying, meet me at the clock tower, was actually about the hotel Biltmore rather than the current Grand Central. Anyway, it's a side note. But um, so you can imagine Emilio wanting to, you know, the Biltmore in Havana, the Biltmore in San Juan, the Biltmore in Miami. He stayed at the Biltmore in Cuba. And he took courses with a number of terribly important people. Howard Trafton was his first professor. Robert Beverly Hale, Robert Ward Johnson, uh, Rob, um, uh, Frank, uh, Frank Vincent Dumond, the great teacher of Pogolotti uh, and Amelia Pelaez. Um, and of course, um, um, Yasuo Koniyoshi, one of the great, most popular teachers there. And so this allowed me, uh, in conjunction with the archives of American art at the Smithsonian, to start to put together the influences of his early life. And we can see you know, Howard Trafton, his first teacher, taught a course on uh, layout, design, graphic design, not figure drawing or composition, but, you know, um, textiles. He's famous for the Trafton script. And you can see these doodles on the upper left of designs that Emilio was engaging in for, you know, to produce, I don't know, fabric. 
We see also his first published figure drawing from the League Quarterly of 46 in an essay by his teacher, Robert Ward Johnson, on how we draw. Um, he always said he studied with Reginald Marsh, and although it's not recorded in the enrollment, there's no reason that he could not have sat in on courses. And these two lower images, the muscle man and the sad clown, are very much in the vein of Reginald uh, Marsh's sort of burlesque and muscle men beach scenes that he was producing in New York and Coney Island, and very much part of that social realist world that uh, would have influenced him. And we see a number of early drawings of uh, cityscapes, uh, tugboats wrestling for position in, in, the, in the bay. Uh, he traveled throughout New England, and he continued to engage in portraiture, society ladies, a kind of um, broad ranging uh, realism that was never academically uh, factual uh, and yet uh, very loose and, and, and um, kind of empirically arrived at. Uh, an academic training that was um, uh, really uh, rooted in the vernacular rather than the major souvenir boots. During this time, we also find that he traveled to Europe on several trips. You see, uh, from the time he stopped uh, his studies in 48, uh, we see him on the left on his first trip going to uh, France. Uh, in the middle, we see him with his mother and stepfather, Philippe Cosio del Pomar, that I'll describe later, um, at the amphitheater in Rome. A wonderful landscape of Capri on the upper right. And of course, he continued to go to Cuba and show his, uh, look at the vernacular architecture around his family estate, the uh, sugar plantation and central in outside of Camagüey. It's drawing parallels between Europe America, North America, and the Caribbean. At a certain moment, Anne introduced me to Eric Stapper, who I believe is also hopefully somewhere uh, uh, listening in. He was the uh, trustee of the um, Emilio Sanchez estate. And uh, Eric uh, with Anne started giving me all sorts of information. And one day Eric said to me, you know that Emilio had a stepbrother, don't you? I said, no, I had no idea he had a stepbrother. He said, well, we've never been able to track him down. Maybe you could find him. So, of course, of course, that was a uh, provocation that I couldn't resist. I had no luck. I kept trying to find, um, uh, his name was Miguel, uh, and I couldn't find him. I found one internet link, but no go. Now, Emilio's stepfather, Felipe, that I mentioned earlier, had founded an art school in Mexico in 1937 in the town of San Miguel de Allende, an art school which he thought of as the Bauhaus of the Americas. And he wrote a, uh, bi um, a, a biography of, he wrote a, a, you know, his autobiography of his time there. And that was translated into English by a firecracker from Texas named Malene McCalla, who I hope is also on the line. I was able to track her down. And Malene gave me the uh, email and telephone number of Emilio's stepbrother, Miguel Cosillo. That, again, opened up an entire new world of material in Mexico, but also in the archives of Felipe Cosillo del Pomar, who was Peruvian by origin, and his archives are located in Piura, uh, uh, Peru, where, uh, where he died. And so between Peru and San Miguel de Allende, I was able to find an extraordinary amount of material on this cutting edge art school that included artists from Mexico, Rufino Tamayo, Carlos Merida, North American artists, uh, Sterling Dickinson, and uh, uh, European artists like uh, uh, Jela uh, Schmidt Archipenko, who was the wife of Alexander Archipenko, who taught sculpture there. A fascinating group of people who, between 1937 and 1951, when Emilio was regularly visiting San Miguel and staying, uh, engaging with the, and exhibiting with the art community there, uh, there was an enormous amount of information 
we found images of him at a costume party. Uh, he would stay with his mother and stepfather at this beautiful ranch on the outskirts of the city that became a kind of home for visiting artists, uh, writers, you know, pretty much everyone you can imagine passed through uh, San Miguel. And of course, uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros was uh, briefly teaching there, lecturing there, and painted the refectory. So all of this was part of Emilio's early training that we really never knew about. And while he was there, he was not only trying to capture the uh, colonial era architecture of San Miguel, you know, compare bring it with the pillar of North American Cuba, but is where he started to look at the indigenous American people and folk um, customs of the San Miguelense people. Um, and this was something that his stepfather had uh, was strongly uh, um, concerned about indigenismo and uh, the minister of education in Mexico at the time Jose Vasconcelos was supportive of the school. And he, of course, was the author of the Cosmica Raza, this idea of a kind of indigenous culture that um, uh, is different from anyone previously in the Americas and that the art can emerge from that environment. And so we see Emilio drawn to this kind of customs of the people, their, their habits, their, their, their architecture, and he actually translates that idea or takes that idea shortly thereafter in the early 1950s to the Caribbean, where he starts to travel to Jamaica, to Haiti, to St. Uh, Croix and St. Thomas, Grenada, Barbados. And he starts to look at the people of the Caribbean uh, in the same way that he was looking at the people of San Miguel. And drawing on the dignity of their day-to-day -day activities, the, the kind of poetry of their um, uh, behavior and the contrast of the clothing to the landscape to the, the, the shadows and, and drawing a parallel that was very unusual at the time. Uh, and, and Nathan, I know, is going to talk about that more Finally, uh, I conclude with the serendipity of meeting a number of family in France. And now why is this serendipitous? Because um, when an artist um, changes and they move on to new things, what do they do with the old stuff that they no longer want? They give them as gifts to family and friends. They don't give them to museums. The museums, the galleries, they want the new stuff. So Emilio gave an extraordinary amount of old stuff to family and friends. And that's where you find it. You don't find it in the galleries, in the museums. But you find it among the family and friends. And that's where you get a really intimate portrait of his life, early life in Cuba, growing up on a sugar plantation and the, let's face it, the privilege of coming from extraordinary wealth and having uh, access to uh, a quality of life outside of Camagüey, but also in Havana. And uh, photographs, uh, drawings that he would produce of these places uh, while he was there. Uh, and we get, and, and the family and friends are too many to mention, but you can see that this is, one of the most fruitful uh, places to find um, intimate portrait of who he was and how he grew up and how he became an artist in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, the book ends in 1960, and um, that's when Emilio left Cuba and never returned. He was 39 years old. And so the book purposefully looks at his early life and all of the aspects that, that um, contributed to his formation as an artist. The umbrella under which I examine this is the idea of convergence. A number of forces, people, ideas that all come together and some consciously, some unconsciously 
um, he adopts, embraces, and eventually uh, they all uh, come together to make who he is. After 1960, he never returns to Cuba. He travels to the Caribbean, Europe, Latin America, but it's a different different world. He gives up a lot. He stops doing a lot of what he did. Now, finally, my last image here is I conclude with the next two books that I've uh, produced. And uh, why am I saying that? Well, two reasons. The first is that um, I believe in um, building communities of scholars. I don't believe in the academic squirrel that hoards their information and keeps it to themselves. Right? I would hope that this book on Emilio might open doors for further research uh, on Emilio's life and activities. And I would welcome anyone interested in that. Uh, and so the other reason is that this is my second talk at Books and Books. And I mentioned earlier the great art stores throughout Europe and uh, North America. And uh, bookshops are like those great art stores. They are not just purveyors of material, books, and whatever, but they serve a community. They are actually nodes of convergence, where ideas are shared, where material is shared, where people come together and debate. And so I want to thank Books and Books especially, and hope that um, my next two books might find another place uh, in the uh, the sequence of uh, virtual authors. So that's really it for my initial talk. And much of what I said is in the book. So I'd like to now um, uh, stop sharing this. And um, let me see. Um, so, uh, so am I, all right, now we're back. So um, thank you everyone for putting up with that. Victor, thank you for this beautifully illustrated introduction. Uh, you know, the publication of this book is very exciting to me because it achieves the goals of the Emilio Sanchez Foundation. The mission of the foundation is to preserve and promote Emilio Sanchez's legacy by making his art and contributions available to future audiences and scholars. The foundation undertook this mission in three main ways by placing his art in worthy museums, institutions, and collections, by securing his archival materials, by donating them to the Archives of American Art and the Cuban Heritage Center, and finally, by producing the first scholarly monograph on Sanchez. Up to that point, there were no books on Sanchez, and I thought it was imperative to publish a monograph. The resulting book, Hard Light, the works of Emilio Sanchez, presented three essays that introduced new and fresh critical consideration of Sanchez. The larger purpose of this book was to lay the ground for future scholars and to use it as a springboard. And Victor, you have done exactly that with this book, which adds considerable new research and uh, insight to create a portrait of Sanchez that continues to become more and more complex. You have written a scholarly biography that brings to life aspects of Sanchez's life and career from the 1930s through the 1950s that have been up to now been underreported, such as his early years in Cuba, the influence of the School of Fine Arts in San Miguel de Allende, his North American education, starting with boarding schools, then college, and then his attending the Arts Students League. I also find it fascinating that your book reads as part travelogue as you follow him through his numerous travels around the Caribbean, Europe, and the United States. With an abundance of detail in his historical excavation, this project is clearly a labor of love. And what I like about this book, as you just mentioned a little bit earlier, is that it ends in the 1950s, you said 1960, and it encapsulates the years he had a connection with Cuba. It holds the seeds to his formative years, which stayed with him as he matured as an artist. And so, Victor, to begin a discussion among us, um, could you talk to us a little bit about 
how he was received in Cuba as an artist. How, uh, did he have exhibitions in Havana? Uh, what was his critical reception? Just a little flavor of him as an artist in, in Havana. Sure, sure. Um, so Emilio grew up in the countryside of Camagüey, but a lot of family um, had uh, properties in Havana. Uh, and his grandmother moved to Havana, uh, and his father had a place there, and his, eventually his mother and stepfather had a place there, and numerous cousins. So he was always traveling throughout Cuba. And um, he would go to places like Cienfuegos and Trinidad, uh, and on his ways to from Havana to uh, Camagüey, he would stop at Matanzas. So he was always on the road and always touring. Um, he, um, early in his career, his exhibitions were largely in New York, uh, in Mexico, uh, Paris, uh, elsewhere in North America, and um, he did not exhibit until uh, 1956 in Havana. And uh, that coincided with the period when his mother and stepfather uh, left San Miguel and acquired uh, an apartment in one of the most fashionable new modern buildings, the Almar uh, in uh, Havana in the uh, Miramar, uh, Alturas de Miramar neighborhood. And in fact, his stepfather was getting quite a bit of uh, publicity for his publications and his writings on art. And um, his stepfather curated the very first exhibition that he had at the Liceum, which was this progressive women's club uh, in um, the Vedado. And uh, that was uh, widely received, very well received with quite a bit of, um, of uh, press release. And immediately after that, that was his first solo show in Cuba. But immediately after that, he had a show at a, a small, lesser known gallery called the Galeria Cubana, that um, it was a show on, get this, religious art in Cuba. And it was a combination of uh, established vanguard artists, Kundo, Abela, Mariano, uh, Amelia Pelaez, and some up and coming young figures like Emilio and uh, Zilia Sanchez. And one of the big debates at this exhibition was whether realist uh, or abstract art really uh, could convey effectively aspects of the ineffable, of the unknown, of the mystical. And Emilio emerged out of this exhibition curiously as a kind of new young talent who was able to, in fact, um, Graziella Pogolotti, the daughter of the artist uh, and an emerging art critic, described him as a kind of Baroque modernist. Emilio never mentions that exhibition in anything he does, never again, despite being shown with some of the greatest uh, Cuban vanguard and some of the cutting edge young people. And we can talk about that. Um, then in 1959, after the revolution, there were several uh, important exhibitions. The first was the salon, the annual salon at the Museum of Fine Arts. And this was the first salon after the new revolutionary government took, took control. Emilio submitted works in the prints section, not the drawings or paintings or sculpture. And again, he was very well received in the press and Pogolotti again described him as having a unique style unto his own. And in fact, one of the debates in the 59 Salon, whether abstraction was capable of conveying the mission or the goals or the agenda of the revolution, because it didn't have any kind of realism associated with it. And ironically, a wealthy, super wealthy Cuban Emilio was associated with saying, this is where we need to go. We need to go down this path. Because he was capturing this kind of indigenous Cuban identity, right? The real Cubans. Um, on the heels of that exhibit, he had his final exhibition at the Lyceum in 1959, uh, a massive solo exhibition with prints and drawings. Again, extraordinarily well received. But it was very clear that Emilio in the early 1960s 
was going to have nothing to do with the new government. And his entire family fled in an April of 1960. He said goodbye. And he had also built a, a house and studio in the Biltmore, uh, Reparto Biltmore, that his cousin, um, uh, the architect cousin, designed for him. He never even got to inhabit them. So uh, the, the, the interesting thing about Emilio is that he got a lot more press in Cuba in the 50s than we have historically recognized. And um, came to an end. Well, yes. Well, that's extremely interesting to see this young man who's you know taking off in his career and wanting to set a home in Cuba and then is just cut short after his first large exhibition there. Thanks for that. And thank you. Um, Nathan, I was just wanting to ask you if you could please give us a little bit of a his, historical significance of how Sanchez fits in with the Cuban vanguardia movement going on at that time or how he fits in. I think to answer that question, I might build upon something that Victor just said, which is, and, and that you uh, very eloquently um, summarized, that here is this artist who's on the verge of being discovered and then things completely change. And, it's, and in many ways, that is the story or the legacy of so many vanguardia artists or European vanguard artists um, who are on the verge of sort of being discovered or greatness. I'm thinking obviously of Vincent van Gogh, an artist who owns Have we lost? Yeah, I, I've Nathan? lost him. Nathan, I think you may need to come back. Please come back. <laughs> um, in the meantime, let me um, carry on, And Okay. Well, um, so I'm wondering if I should go on to the next question that I was planning to ask. Uh, I know um, uh, Nathan is familiar with this question, so we can bring him in when we get there. Um, I, I wanted to bring, after we talk about Sanchez in the Cuban context, and the Cuban art world, to bring up the fact that as an artist, he was pigeonholed as a Cuban artist by his early gallerists, because they understood that that was the best way to market his art and probably serve them all very well. There is no doubt about Sanchez's Cuban identity, which Victor, Victor describes in his book in depth, uh, starting with his family roots that go back to the beginning of the 19th century and the influence of his grandfather, who was one of the most important industrialists at the turn of the 20th century in Cuba. Sanchez was brought up in his grandfather's household in Camagüey, where I am certain he acquired his love for the beauty of the land and the people. However, the chapter on the years he attended the Art Students League shows that all of his influential teachers were American artists and designers. And as many of you know, the Art Students League is located in New York City, Sanchez's city of choice, where he decided to live for the rest of his life and um, where he developed as an artist for the following 14 decades and was influenced by the movements of the time, such as pop art and minimalism. There is no doubt that his aesthetic was rooted most strongly in American modernism. But before we move on and talk about him as an American artist, I would like to continue the discussion with Nathan of him uh, as a Cuban artist within the Latin American art world. Nathan, are you there? No. Oh, well. Let's see. It comes and goes. Um, yeah. So I mean, I would, uh, I would say I would say a few things. I mean, I think I, I he was trained in, in in New York, and he was trained, um, and his stepfather was an avid um, uh, fan of people like Reginald Marsh and Thomas Hart Benton, and and his you know stepfather was an avid proponent of of uh, social realism. Okay, we got Nathan back. You good? Sorry about so that. Nathan. All right. <laughs> modern I just life. To... Modern life. Uh, okay. 
So I heard that you were talking um, more about the Artist Students League. Is that right? Well, I was just starting to go into his American oh, side, but I would like to reel back because we did not really discuss him within the Cuban and Latin American art world and how he fit in at that time. And then, yeah. uh, and then we can move on to the American, which I know you will have something to say there as Perfect. well. Yeah, so as I was saying, I, I think I was uh, patting Victor on the back there and saying that he is providing these narratives and these histories, these unknown names in Cuban Vanguardia that are so important. And yet when we do actually begin to look at Emilio Sanchez's vernacular work and particularly, and I would argue uh, probably some of his most important works would be those depictions of black Caribbean individuals. When we begin to look at his celebration rather than his stereotype of black individuals, that's then where that interest in positivist indigenism is going to, I think, really inform this larger narrative of Cuban vanguardia or actually fill in um, some of the uh, the missing links of the narratives that again have not been written. Um, and again, I, I don't want to presume that as a white privileged Cuban man that he understood what it meant to be a black Caribbean individual. And yet um, when we think about the US um, murals of Thomas Hart Benton and Marsh, there is a racial stereotyping, almost a gross racial stereotyping at times of the black body. And we simply just do not see that in Emilio Sanchez's work. And so I think it's those unwritten narratives of race, particularly at this particular moment in the 21st century, that can begin to really help us go back and readdress issues of race and class in uh, the Cuban vanguardia movements. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you have anything to add to that, Victor, or should we go on to the American side now? Yeah, I think we should go on to the American side. I mean, I think Nathan. Okay. So, you know, so, so Nathan, you know, there is no doubt that. Oh, I, would, I would add one thing, sorry. Um, yeah. In an interview with the Bronx uh, Museum, he specifically talked about giving those scenes a certain dignity. I mean, he was not poking fun he was not making caricatures, but he was trying to find the dignity in that vernacular. And he said very, very clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, going to his American influences, which are covered well here with the Art Students League, you know, Emilio towards the end of his life was seeking to get more recognition within the American public. And his gallery in New York was ACA Gallery that has a roster that is composed mostly of American artists. And uh, Bernard Goldberg, an important New York gallerist who specializes in American modernism, was seriously considering an exclusive representation with the Emilio Sanchez Foundation. I also have noticed that at the auction houses, they have struggled with this issue. He is most often placed in the Latin American art auctions, but every once in a while he appears in post-war American art auctions where his work fits in very well. So uh, we can see that he's deeply rooted in Cuba, but for the next 40 decades of his life, four, I mean four decades of his life, he's really influenced by American uh, arts. So, how would you place them within the American art world? Well, first I would say that a lot of what you're just describing is indicative of art historical scholarship at mid-century, where um, there was a tendency to pigeonhole or exoticize or think in black and whites and not in those gray areas. Um, you know, as the three of us have discussed uh, on our own, uh, what makes Emilio Sanchez such a fantastic figure, but maybe a difficult figure to pigeonhole is that he is both a Latin American artist, a Cuban artist, and an American artist as well. And that he has a foot in each of those camps. And I think because that can be complicated to then sell, right? How do you then sell? well, this is a Latin American artist, but he's really influenced by American art. Um, you know, that, that's hard for a gallerist uh, to, to make that pitch. And yet for an art historian, it opens up so many possibilities, right? Isn't it great that here's an individual who sees himself as having one foot in Cuba and the Caribbean and Mexico and another foot in the American sea. But 
I would say if you look at those works that he's producing in the Art Students League, this is at a time when Cuban American uh, painters exhibition is opening up in New York. Um, he's looking to those influences. He's looking to Benton and Marsh into American regionalism. Um, one of the things that Victor very, very delicately and nicely touches upon is the fact that um, you know, he's not just a Latin American artist, he's not just a Cuban artist in the American scene, but he's also a queer artist. And there's a whole, I think, other chapter that could be written, the next chapter of Victor's book on queer culture and the sort of homoeroticism of American regionalism and those paintings of Thomas Hart Benton. Benton was a macho, sexist, misogynist individual. I understand that he was not a very nice guy in real life, right? But his paintings have this sort of homoerotic quality to them. and you know, here is then Emilio Sanchez, who is a gay artist, who is picking up on that homoeroticism and playing with it, I think, in really interesting ways. And um, the, um, what do you call them, um, Victor? The, um, not the street scenes, but the uh, sort burlesque. of cabaret and burlesque scenes burlesque. of, yeah, of that time. I mean, so indicative, not just of the New York scene, but what was going on in, in Europe during the 30s and the 40s, um, you know, that that's all there. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, we don't have to hide those influences. I think we can really discuss them and celebrate them and talk about how, you know, here's a man who's really drawing from a bunch of different um, iconographic and symbolic sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had said earlier that the, the book approach, the, the approach to the book was through the lens of convergence, which would allow a variety of different subjects like race and gender and orientation and whatever, uh, but also influence. And, and um, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is that as Emilio is starting his education at the Art Students League in the winter of 1944, in March, MoMA opens Modern Cuban Painters, uh, the, an exhibition of the, the first exhibition of Cuban artists in the United States with a catalog and a uh, remarkable presence. And we know that Emilio's stepfather came to visit and see the show. We have to assume that Emilio saw the show with his stepfather, right? And, it, you know, you have to think that, you know, Emilio probably very early on decided that, okay, I'm of course Cuban, and there are a number of Cuban themes that I'm interested in, but I want to do that from here, from New York. I want to do it from outside of the established vanguard um, perception. And, and that's what, what Emilio does is he brings to Cuban art a distinctly personal, if not North American perspective uh, that uh, I think we could probably understand better for the research, to be quite honest. Yes. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we're all Americans, right? North American, Central American, and South American. And so there is this, again, um, perhaps uh, arbitrary distinction being drawn between these these um, these boxes. Well, Nathan, this is what makes me so exciting because it's really contemporary scholarship and contemporary thinking that has the open mind to be able to look at the complexity of Emilio Sanchez that in the 60s or even before they were not able to. Yeah. And that wasn't even considered. It was just this very pigeonholed worldview and he stuck to it till the, till the end with this attempt to maybe break into the American market if he could. But as we all know, it's a much larger market and it, would, it takes a long time to enter a market. Uh, but maybe today, and you know, as, as, as you are mentioning, um, in museums, they're now no longer saying where artists come from because sometimes it's so complex, they don't even want to go there and it's, it gets people confused. And, um, and also the auction houses are thinking of taking away Latin American art and American and just adding in modern uh, and, and different time periods. So I think we're moving towards an era that is more inclusive, obviously we are, and um, it's very exciting. And I also think maybe we can talk a little bit more of this, you know, the heightened awareness that we have today with race and gender diversity 
And um, something that you had mentioned to me in our previous talk, Nathan, was that Emilia reminded you of Toulouse-Lautrec. And I thought that was just such a wonderful comparison because it's like an outsider, somebody who's a little different and how he can look at the world with a kind of humanity. And, um, and I think that this is really the way to look at Emilio Sanchez. I mean, he's always compared to, you know, Edward Hopper and, you know, Hopper's view of uh, America and the humanity was so desolate and depressed and isolationist. And that's not at all what Emilio Sanchez is about. And I think we have to look at his empty houses in a new way now and see really what that emptiness means. And there's and there's some people who are already talking about the inside and the outside coming together. And the, these beautiful insights that are coming from younger scholarship that is able to see the depth um, that is in this work. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The, the theme of interiority versus exteriority, um, I had forgotten that I mentioned Toulouse Lautrec, but you know, here are two men that come from uh, the bourgeoisie, right? That, but are more interested in a class that's not theirs, um, as a as a way to actually sort of escape into that that other class or that other identity. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I I can only reiterate the fact that this is rich material, and the hope obviously is that more scholars in the contemporary scene employ different methodologies to really dive into Sanchez's artistic agenda here. Yes. I would, I would add, Anne, that um, two things. I would even go further than to lose our track. I was saying in my at the beginning of my talk, he reminded me of late 18th and early 19th century grand tour artists who were going around the world, sketching and drawing what, what they saw. And, and I think that's a fascinating idea of the idea of a, of a kind of a 20th century grand tour or a 20th century travel artist that uh, Nathan mentioned it in his introduction, a 20th century flaneur. I think, you know, that there's, there's really room for st uh, study on that. The other thing um, about the haunting interiors that I would point out is that um, they're desolate and empty, and yet he draws meticulously every single wooden board and thatch. I mean, it's not empty at all. It's the most cluttered drawing you can ever imagine. It's cluttered emptiness. I mean, emptiness with more stuff than you could ever imagine. And that, I think that is a really an extraordinary gift that he's given us, that he can, what, what one teacher of mine used to call expressive blankness. You know, it's, it's really, Mm -hmm. well, I, I think that applies very nicely to the works from the 40s and the 50s, but later in the 60s and the 70s, when he's influenced by pop and minimalism, mm -hmm. they really become empty. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and so it's also interesting to see how he evolves that way. And, and maybe there could be uh, insights as you discuss uh, queerness in these different time periods and how it can come through in different ways. And uh, we, we, it's, we've been here for an hour. And so I think uh, it might be a nice time to speak about quickly what the future of Emilio Sanchez's legacy is. And I know, Victor, you have something under your sleeve about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, um, I, I mentioned earlier that um, I, I don't want to be an academic squirrel and I don't want to be seen as the Emilio Sanchez scholar. I want other people to do that. But um, next summer is the 100th anniversary of the birth of Emilio, June 2021. 20, uh, and so uh, Sergio Cernuda uh, and his wife, Luisa Lignarolo uh, of the LNS Gallery in uh, Miami, uh, we're organizing a centenary celebration uh, uh, exhibition uh, and there will be a catalog, I should note. Um, so um, uh, Emilio uh, seems to be the gift that keeps on giving. So uh, at least, um, you know, there's uh, next summer to look forward to. Uh, but uh, I think um, uh, there's a lot more in the bigger picture to be considered. Yes, yeah. 
And, you know, as the uh, former executive director of the Emilio Sanchez Foundations, I have a whole list of projects that people can work on <laughs> for Emilio Sanchez. Oh, and sure. I yeah, and talk to the young up and coming scholars. Uh, but the treasure trove of Cuban drawings from the Metropolitan Museum yep. certainly need an exhibition <clears throat> with a, a catalog. Also, the years following the next four decades also need the kind of study that you have given to the first 30 years of his life. And, um, you know, his relationship with Puerto Rico is huge. After the Cuban Revolution, many Cubans started to go to Puerto Rico, as did Emilio Sanchez. For about 20 years, he went on a regular basis. And even in 1974, he won first prize in the San Juan Biennial uh, of Latin American prints, uh, just to show how, how involved he was in the Puerto Rican uh, community. And also his involvement with Miami and with New York City uh, would be interesting to look at because he was going to Miami on a regular basis as well. Also uh, a book about his prints. He was a very uh, prolific mm. lithographer and uh, it would be a splendid overview, uh, a retrospective of his entire career because he did lithographs from the beginning to the end. And um, also a full-fledged retrospective with uh, revisionary viewpoints and uh, inclusive of his uh, complexity. And um, if you have any other suggestions, I am I can always add them to my list. <laughs> well, I, I forgot, I neglected to mention that three years ago, Nathan and I curated an exhibition of media in South Florida collections. When I arrived to Miami, um, mm -hmm. this project that had started when I was in Connecticut, I needed to make it much more, um, less about me and more about you know Miami, and so Nathan very um, very generously uh, joined that, and so I, I'm, I'm very grateful to him for having been part of that, being part of the book, and um, maybe um, maybe we'll put our heads together and take tackle one of these down the yeah. road. Wonderful, <laughs> very exciting, <laughs> and I'm wondering there if are some, <laughs> there are some questions from the uh, the audience, I believe. Yeah, we can ask Christina if she can uh, chime in. So um, there are a few observations here from Julia P. Hertzberg. I knew him fairly well from 1978 to mid 80s. He was a super Cuban in terms of his autobiographical identity. I knew he never went back to Cuba. He never spoke about his training to me other than he had gone to boarding school and I thought he went to an American university. Did he? Victor, this is brilliantly, this is a brilliantly researched project. Thanks so very much. Um, he did. In um, the early 1930s under the uh, Machado dictatorship, the family uh, sent him away from Cuba at the age of 11. He studied at a number of boarding schools, including the Fessenden School in Boston, um, the uh, Ransom Everglades School in Miami, and eventually he settled at high school at the uh, Choate uh, Academy in um, uh, Wallingford, Connecticut. Uh, it was not then Choate Rosemary Hall. But um, after Choate, he spent a year at Yale University and then transferred to the University of Virginia, where he actually spent uh, uh, close to three years uh, studying uh, no art. He studied, you know, basic uh, history, language, uh, sciences, you know, the normal College of Arts and Sciences things. But uh, the university cleared out in the summer of 1943 because of World War II. And um, at that point, Emilio decided, um, even though he had registered for the draft in Charlottesville, Virginia, and we have records of all of that, he decided to enroll at the Art Students League and pursue a, a lifelong passion. So if his artistic training that we were saying earlier was North American, his um, you know, adolescent education was entirely North American and exclusive. And again, the book goes into great detail with some anec wonderful anecdotes about his time at the various schools and some of the challenges that he faced. But, um, um, and I would simply add that um, uh, the first time I met Ann Cole, we realized that we both graduated together from the University of Virginia as well. Uh, she was art history, architectural history, and I was undergraduate architecture. I said, I know this person. 
-hmm. And so Emilio, it seems like I've always, uh, I've always felt that I never came across Emilio. I think Emilio found me. He said, I need, I need a sucker that's going to take on this project. And I think Victor's the right one. <laughs> well, bravo. Uh, but I, I do want to say a little anecdote about the University of Virginia because they took on uh, a nice collection of uh, Emilio Sanchez drawings at the end and uh, paintings. They took primarily his North American because uh, University of Virginia art collection specializes in New York artists and they wanted to include him specifically as a New York artist. So it was really fascinating for me to see how he entered different collections um, depending on how they wanted to look at him. Right. And I might just add to our listeners, if you aren't familiar with Julia Hertzberg's research, I don't know her personally, but I know her research. She's a fantastic art historian, a scholar of uh, Cuban modernism, research on Mufred Olam. So, um, you know, there's a great example of someone who's doing that sort of revisionist art history to, to look at different nuances of what it meant to be a vanguardia artist at that time. So yes. I'm thrilled Thank that you. she's listening to this conversation. <laughs> so we have, um Time for one more question from Mary Murray. Uh, did Sanchez know Leon Paul Smith in New York? I have no no knowledge of that. I've no. never come across never come across that. No. And then an observation: most of Emilio Sanchez's artworks at the Met were collected by William S. Lieberman, former chairman of the 20th Century Art Department of MoMA who was a good friend of Emilio. This is Balmaria. Um, well, um, actually, uh, at the time, Lieberman was still at MoMA. Uh, Lieberman came to the Met uh, a bit later. And um, uh, uh, at the time of Emilio, the um, a curator, uh, the name just escapes me, it'll come to me, um, uh, Arthur Houghton was the CEO and um, the, the, the Chief Curator, and help me here, his name, ay, 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 it escapes me, but it was before Lieberman. Um, Emilio worked very hard, was very close with Bill uh, Lieberman, and the Lieberman papers at MoMA uh, have, it. there are a number of correspondence between them. Emilio was, um, one of the things that he did is he created the Philippe Cosillo del Pomar Fund at MoMA uh, while Bill Lieberman was uh, there. And of course, Bill and Emilio traveled to San Juan quite a bit in the 1960s. And um, Bill also, um, uh, there's some wonderful letters in the late 50s, early 60s between correspondence between them. But Bill was at MoMA at that time. Well, I would like to thank all of you for being with us tonight with Books and Books. You are remarkable. Thank you so much. Um, Please remember to our viewers out there that you can order this book at Books and Books. Please do. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's keep the conversation <laughs> going and hopefully we will see each other in real life very soon. It was a tremendous pleasure and I thank Florida International University, the Cuban Research Institute, Jorge Duani, who is out there watching, Aime Correa, Muchísimas gracias. Eh, y nos veremos pronto. I hope. Thank you. And good evening. Thank you.